Hello, everyone. I can see that we have some participants joining in already. That's really nice to see. Um, welcome to this webinar by Linköping University. This webinar is about um, is to all of you that have been admitted to a distance program at Linköping University. So first of all, congratulations for getting admitted. That's a really, really big step in, in doing this program and, and getting your master's degree, for example. Um, I'm here today with uh, Lisa, who's a student of a program. Lisa, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, everybody. And I'm very excited about this webinar with you all. And I'm going to try to give you a little snapshot of what it's like to study gender study at Linshobe University and what it's like to do a distant, distant master program. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm going to do my best to answer them. Uh, and yeah, congratulations to you being admitted to the program. Yeah, so for some technicalities, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I would just ask you to use the Q&A function, which you can find at the bottom of your screen when you open the Zoom page. And that way, it, that makes it a little bit easier for me to um, keep track of all the questions that you might be asking, and then I can forward them to Lisa as well. So Lisa is from the um, gender studies program, but we do have four different distance programs. We have adult learning and global change. We have aging and social change. We have child studies and of course, gender studies. So don't feel left out if you're not from the gender studies program. This webinar is just all about trying to answer some questions about what's it like to study a distance program and how you can better prepare yourself. Um, also, a quick note, this webinar is being recorded and you will get a link to this recording afterwards. So if you miss any parts or if you'd like to revisit it later, that will be completely possible. So you don't need to worry about that. All right. So, Lisa, the first question that I want to ask you is what is the key difference between a distance and an on campus program? Like, what would you say is the key difference? Well, obviously, the key difference is that you're not on campus. So you're studying in your space, on your time, and, and all the lectures and the activities are taken are, are happening virtually. Uh, so that's the biggest difference that you're not in a classroom, you're not amongst your fellow students, uh, and you don't meet with your teachers uh, in, a, in a physical space. Um, so, so that's obviously the biggest difference, and it's a lot to um, to get used to at first, but um, it can really be a great advantage and how it works with your life and your schedule. But that's that's really the biggest difference. What made you choose a, a distance program over an in-person program? Um, so I'm uh, I'm from Sweden, but I'm living in the U.S. So for me, I was looking for an online uh, master's program um, because it works better with my setup in my life. Uh, and I'm also working aside from studying. So I was looking for something flexible and I was ready to do my master's. But, um, you know, I was not ready to uh, come back to Sweden and do an on campus uh, thing. And I also didn't want to involved with something on campus uh, where I'm located because I'm also traveling around a lot. And so for me, that was an obvious choice. Um, and then I, so I did a lot of research on, on different uh, distance um, programs that I could, uh, that I potentially wanted to do. And I was very drawn to the structure of Lynn Shopping online study programs. And then obviously I choose gender studies and it's something and that I really uh, wanted to do. So every ticked all my boxes uh, and I'm very happy with my decision so far, yeah. That's great. So you, you mentioned that the workload is quite flexible. What would you say, like what is the structure of a typical week for you in terms of studies? Do you have lectures? Do you have online practicals? Do you have group work? Yeah, it's a, it's a variety of different tasks every week. Um, and one thing that I was posi positively surprised by was how structured the program is, even though it's, um, you know, it's, it's virtual and it's, you're a little bit on your own. Um, you have a very uh, structured schedule to go by. So every week there's uh, a theme, right? So you have a lecture, 
you have readings, you have uh, usually a seminar, and uh, depending on the course, you typically also have like a co-tutor session. So it's a small group with your um, with your classmates where you discuss what you've been engaged with during the week. Um, so there's a couple of different activities that keeps you very engaged. So you don't feel as removed from the from uh, from the class and and, and the act activities uh, that everybody's doing, but in their own space. Um, so and it depends a little bit on the course, of course. Like, uh, but the general structure is uh, a lecture, a seminar, and a co-tutor session every week. Nice. And what about the, the workload? Is there a lot of self-study time? Is it hard to combine it with um, like your, your job? You said you were working at the same time. Um, it also depends a little bit on the course. And, and, you know, if it's usually in the beginning of a course, it's more lectures, it's more readings to engage with. And then towards the end of the course, there's more, uh, you know, working on assignments and writing uh, papers and, and so forth. Um, so depending on what your life looks like outside of that, uh, it can be it can be feel like a lot. Um, but if you find um, the structure of the course and like you get into this flow, um, I, I don't find it overwhelming at all. And I feel like it works well with what I do aside from studying. Um, so it's just, you know, really get the readings in. So whenever you have time for me, like I, I, I spend quite a lot of time on a, on a train uh, going to work and then that's study time. So you just need to find your windows uh, where you can engage with the literature, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously have access to internet. That's a crucial one. Um, so you can always you know, connect and be a part of the active learning activities uh, like the, the seminars and the, and the co-tutor sessions. We had a quick question here, like how many hours per week, more or less, would you say that you spend on the program? Um, I would say I try to study intensely uh, four hours per day. Mm. Um, and then I try to give myself a break during the weekend. I also know a lot of my classmates. So I, I don't work full time aside from this, but a lot of my fellow classmates do. So then, you know, they try to study maybe a little bit in the morning and then get some study in during the night. And then weekends becomes, you know, a study weekend. Um, so I know a lot of my classmates have a different setups. Um, so it's it's flexible in that sense, like no matter what your life looks like, you, you can, um, you know, you can manage your schedule in such a way that it can make it work for you. And we're also uh, located in different time zones. Um, I'm, I'm, for example, in, in uh, based in New York City, um, which is different. We're six hours behind uh, Sweden but it still works. Um, you just need to like find your flow and find your, what works for you. And the program is very flexible in that sense. Also the, um, the real time seminars and the real time uh, lectures, there will be a few that you have to uh, log in and be a part, which is, it's not pre-recorded. Um, and usually, um, it works with your, like for me, it's usually early mornings since I'm behind and time zone wise. Mm. Um, so th that's one thing to take into consideration too. I know, uh, I know some of my classmates who's located in Sweden, um, they try to find these pockets. If they have a full-time job, maybe uh, connect to a live session during lunch or um, you know one or two hours in the afternoon um, to find a flexibility in their in the um, during the workday, yeah, that's an in interesting question with the difference in in time zone because we also got a question about if the lectures are mandatory and if there's a possibility that they are recorded. So all the lectures are pre-recorded. Mm. Uh, the mandatory uh, lectures are pre-recorded. However, there's usually a course introduction to every course that's in live that's in real time. 
which is not mandatory. Um, and the seminars uh, that happen mostly every week, depending on the course, um, also is real time, but those are not mandatory either. Uh, but they are not pre-recorded. They're not recorded. Mm. So the ones that are not pre-recorded, the the uh, the real time seminars and, and course um, introductions are not recorded, um, and it's because it's not mandatory. Um, so, so that's it, something to take, in, take into consideration. Yeah, yeah. It it sounds like there really is a lot of flexibility there to to find your own time to study which I think is, of course, the appealing part of doing um, a distance program. Um, what would you say is the, the biggest challenge of studying a distance program? Like you mentioned, you always need to have internet, but is there anything else that's a bit more complicated when doing distance? Uh, well, I think the biggest challenge is to keep yourself engaged and motivated and and uh, also create like a headspace for yourself where you can reflect upon what you're studying because you're not in a physical classroom with your teachers and, and with your classmates. It's not like this environment where you uh, naturally get engaged and, and, and uh, can dive deeper and deeper into it. So you need to kind of set yourself up um, in a way where you can do that yourself uh, so it takes a lot of motivation and uh, determination to um, to really, you know, dig deeper into uh, the learning process. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of help for you um, to stay motivated uh, and stay engaged with your classmates and with the teachers. But it's uh, at the end of the day, it's up to you to participate. Um, so I would say it's for me, it's really important, even though some seminars and, and, and some sessions are not mandatory. I try to make it to every single one to keep myself engaged and, and to also a little bit create this, this environment of, of um, uh, you know, back and forth with teachers and, and, and um, the fellow students. So it's not just a one-way communication that's actually an interaction going on. Um, but, it's up, but it's up to you, to each and every one to actively participate of course of course um the next question which i think was also asked in the q a is uh are there times that you have to travel to lynch shipping um there will be because of the pandemic uh, my i'm so i'm in my first year and i have one more year to go and because in the pandemic it's been a little bit different for me so far but i don't think you guys will be affected by it Hopefully we'll see. <laughs> uh, but every semester, there's a one face-to-face uh, -face week, which takes place on campus. So it's in the beginning of the semester um, and it's an opportunity to uh, engage with your fellow classmates and your teachers and have an active um, learning experience, um, which is an intense week. Um, with lots of activities and, and it's, you know, more interactive kind of way of, of teaching and learning. Um, and as I said, I haven't experienced that yet because of the pandemic. So um, my first face-to-face -face week happening in real time on campus will be in the beginning of next semester. Mm. Um, so for us, uh, they, you know, due to COVID, we did a, did a kind of like a virtual thing of that as well. Um, but um, on campus will definitely be a better experience for so that you, week. So you know well in advance when these on-campus weeks are going to be, so you have time to plan? Yeah, they, uh, um, they're yeah, in the syllabus, but they're also like incorporated into the schedule, which you have access to way in advance. So you know at what dates you, you need to be on campus. Okay. Um, we, we had a question, which I think I'll take upon myself to answer. Uh, it's someone that is currently outside of Sweden and has a few on-campus requirements. They're asking if it's safe to travel to Sweden with the war in Ukraine and COVID, and that their government travel websites list Sweden as high risk due to COVID. So I can, I've been living in Sweden, so I can give you some information about um, the co current COVID regulations in Sweden. 
Um, as many people know, Sweden has taken a more relaxed approach to COVID. So there is no um, mandatory wearing of masks, for example, but there are measurements in place for social distancing. And a lot of events, for example, have a limit in terms of how many people can attend. So there is definitely some control and especially around arrival periods. So January and August, the university takes it upon themselves to especially limit events to the uh, in terms of number of participants and so um, I don't know about in terms of different government travel websites but it is definitely safe to travel to Sweden at the moment of course this can change every time but in terms of the war and such uh, this has not affected Sweden and if you uh, come to if you have any sort of transfer within Europe then that is not a problem at all at this moment. So I hope that calms your uh, calms your concerns a little bit. So uh, in terms of what your government website says, of course, it depends. Each government qualifies Sweden slightly differently, um, but vaccinations are in full swing. And so that is definitely something that um, you have to consider. Obviously, if the university uh, is making these in-person um, weeks happen, it's because the university considers it safe for you to do so. And of course, if you uh, feel that you would like to wear a mask in class, that's of course perfectly allowed. And, and if you'd like to keep your distance, that's also perfectly um, normal and no one will have any issue with that. It's just that Sweden has had a slightly different approach. Um, and so far, in, in terms of students, at least, um, there haven't been any, any big issues at the university. And the university also keeps track of uh, COVID cases. Um, so I hope that calms your concerns a little bit. Um, you mentioned that there's you have some group work from distance. So I think it would be interesting to ask you if it's difficult to like make friends within your program or at least have that connection with other people that are studying the same program uh, my experience is that um, we're a group of international folks who are very eager to share thoughts and ideas and connect so um, we organized um, whatsapp groups and different breakout groups uh, for us to interact with each other. Uh, I also know that there's been some traveling going on, some classmates going to see other classmates at different parts, um, I think mainly Europe. Um, so there's a lot of activities going on. I, I would say though that the, the social activities and the social groups and stuff is, is organized by students. So it's, we have taken that upon ourselves to, to network and to connect. Um, but I would say it's if, if my experience is that there are a lot of us also because we're, you know, we're doing this virtually in our, in, in our own time, in our own um, space, that we feel like it's important to connect and, and engage with all these, you know, um, ideas that we're learning uh, in a setting that's not um, strictly academic. Um, but I would say it's, it's up to you the group of, of you who to make this happen. But it's not been difficult. It's been, it's been ha happening very naturally for us at least. So it's a pretty positive experience even though there's quite a big distance between you. Definitely, definitely. And we tend to help each other out with, you know, with assignments and, and questions. And, um, and if we feel like there's an issue, we, we discuss it uh, in our group and then bring it up with teachers and, and course representatives and so forth. Uh, we do also have two student reps that represents us and uh, talking to teachers and, and course coordinators. Um, so there is a structure of, of, um, of communication that works quite well. That sounds really good. Um, we have a question here that I think is um, from from a little bit further back in the conversation. Uh, how do you know when the mandatory sessions or group sessions are happening? Uh, and how much in advance do you know? So this is someone that's trying to combine it with a 50% work schedule. Um, so how, how much in advance do you know and how do you figure out which sessions are, are mandatory? So every, um, we have access to uh, the Linköping University learning platform, Lizam, where 
there is this uh, schedule function, which is up to date um, for every course. So even before, before the course starts, you have access to that, the upcoming course's schedule. Uh, and there you will see every lecture, every seminar, every uh, mandatory and not mandatory event. Um, so you can plan it way ahead and, and make it work with your schedule. And there's also time for you to reach out to your teacher if, if there is something that wouldn't work for you um, because of your work schedule. There is always a way to make that work with either you do a, um, a compensatory assignment or, or something else. Um, so there's always some flexibility um, that you, so you can meet your needs and, and also not miss out on, on any mandatory learning activities. Very good. Um, there's a question here about whether there are on-campus parts for every single program. Uh, no. So we have four different distance programs and one of them, I believe it is the aging program, but I'm not entirely sure, um, is fully online. Um, but gender studies, as Lisa said, definitely has an in-person uh, part, but this is only once per semester. So it's it's quite relaxed, but I do believe it's the aging program. I'm not entirely sure, um, but all the other ones do have some or other parts that are on campus. Um, all right. Um, let me see here. What questions do we have? Uh, there's a question here. I'm not entirely sure if this refers to the gender studies uh, program. Do you know if there is an option to do a one-year program or a two-year program? So the at least the gender study program, uh, you can choose whether to do a one-year master's or a two-year master. Um, and whether you do one or two, you are required to write um, one thesis, master thesis for each year. So right now I'm doing my first year and I'm writing a thesis and I've decided to do two years. So next year I'll do another thesis. So you can choose to end the program after the first year. Um, and if you're Swedish, this, this will be a, a magister examen. Um, and then you move on and have a full master degree after two years if you choose to do so. Um, I also want to add to that uh, because there's two theses if you do two years that uh, you are expected to defend your thesis on campus for both uh, the one year and two year. Uh, so that's something to take into consider consideration too with traveling to, to Sweden. Um, so yeah, there's options, definitely. Okay, uh, we have a, here, a question here about whether COVID vaccination is mandatory in Sweden. Um, the vaccination itself is not mandatory, but if you're flying to Sweden, for example, most flight companies will require you to have a vaccination certificate to show. Uh, and depending which countries you're traveling to, you might also need to additionally provide a COVID test. So if you're traveling to Sweden for this mandatory week, definitely make sure to check out the, the travel um, websites and, and detailing the, the requirements. Most of them uh, will require COVID vaccination for you to get into Sweden. Once you're in Sweden specifically, at least at the moment, so in, in April right now, um, you don't really need to show a certificate to go to restaurants or any sort of entertainment, for example. Uh, that is how things are right now. Of course, we don't know about the future, um, but hopefully this answers your question. Uh, we have another question about how soon do you know the dates when you have to go to Sweden? So you mentioned that you need to go there at the beginning of next semester. Uh, when did you know that you were already going? Um, so how much time do you have to plan, essentially? Um, that's uh, basically, you know that when in the beginning of the program, you know that there will be one week in the beginning of each semester that's on campus. Um, and so you know that months in advance. Mm. Um, and it's been a little bit different for us due to COVID, uh, where it's been you know, back and forth, whether it's gonna happen on campus or not. Uh, but the week, the face-to-face the -face week, we, we've known since we enrolled in the program. Um, and uh, 
so yeah it's not um a last last couple of weeks it's it's you know that in in months in advance you can you can plan we have a question here about resources um someone's asked if they need to buy books or visit a physical university library near them or are the resources provided by Linköping University? So as a student at Linköping University, you have access to the Linköping University uh, library. Um, so through your uh, student account, you have access to all the literature and readings that we would that we use in the program. And there might be additional readings that you might have to find uh, on your own through a library or or maybe uh, purchases uh, on, on a bookstore or online. Uh, but so far for me, I, I've found all the readings that, that's mandatory for me in the program through the university library. Uh, and it's um, online books and articles. Um, so I don't, I don't, obviously I'm not in Lynn shopping, so I, I can't go to the universe at the library uh, physically and get the books, but it's all um, online. Um, resources. We have a question about how many are people are in your program at the moment. So I think we're um, about 40 people, 40, 45. What I know, I think there have been uh, some changes, but uh, I think, yeah, we're, we're about 40 people. We have someone asking what how does it feel to be an expert in gender studies? Are there any life changes or unique job opportunities? I wouldn't call myself an expert, <laughs> first of all. <laughs> uh, but it's been very, uh, I would say, transformational to engage in gender studies. Um, and uh, for me, it's been, I have a background in development studies. Uh, and I've touched upon gender studies before. So it's not a completely new field to me. But even, even so, I've experienced a lot of breakthroughs, a lot of aha moments and, and an expansion of my way of thinking about uh, not only, um, you know, gender per se, but also like how um, knowledge are produced and, and um, you know, so many blind spots and so many uh, theories and, and ways to analyze my own um, my own life and what I, I encounter in my everyday life, but also professionally. Um, and um, so it's very expansive intellectually. Um, and when it comes to job opportunities, um, there, we, we actually used to have one course, um, which um, we dived into how to create, how to think differently about um, career paths. Uh, and uh, how to create, because a part of the program is, is this aspect of change and how to create change um, within society, but also, you know, how can we think differently about job opportunities um, and the knowledge that we can, that we can provide into different organizations, different uh, aspects of society. So it's, it's a very creative, fun way to play around with uh, thinking about your own future, but also thinking about um, the future at large, um, societal, but also global, uh, national, regional. Um, so yeah, I feel like since I've started the program that I, I've, I feel like there are so many more opportunities and options and way to think about what I can do for my future career than, um, than before I, I started studying. Nice. We have a question about when do you get the syllabus? I believe on the web page from your program, you should be able to consult the syllabus right away. So if you just Google, I think, Lentripping University programs, you should get to the program page. And then you just need to put in the name of your program and that should allow you to um, find your program and also the, the syllabus. So I believe everything's detailed there. Um, we have a question about what to do beyond the master studies, if it's possible for someone after having successfully completed the master studies to continue with doctoral degrees in a distant context as well. So I, I can say that 
your this master program is a master program so once you've finished it you will officially have a master's degree i'm not aware of any phd opportunities from a distance mode specifically do you know anything about that lisa uh no um no i'm not sure about that um i i think there you know you, of course you can and move on and, and do um further studies within gender studies um, but that's independent of the master program. So there's no, not a continuation of, of the master's program per se. I think you need to seek other um, programs and opportunities. Um, yeah, yeah, so I, I, don't know, I don't know more than that. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, PhDs are, are completely separate from, from master's studies, at least in Sweden, um, PhDs are already regarded as uh, full-time work. So for that, um, I'm not aware of any PhD opportunities that can be done completely online. Um, but if it's something you're interested, you can definitely apply for a PhD and then come to Sweden to do it. I know that's that's a possibility and, and many, many people do that. So, but that's completely different because for that you apply through the vacancies page on the university. Again, because they're considered full-time work positions. Um, we, oh, we have someone that asked again about how many hours a day do you, do you think you dedicate to your program per day? Um, I would say at an average about four to five hours a day. Um, and sometimes less, sometimes more. Right now I'm writing my first thesis. So that's, I'm spending more time right now. Um, and that sometimes I, you know, I, uh, maybe spent two hours um, per day studying. So it, it all depends where in the program, what course you are uh, have at the moment. Um, but yeah, between, between two and, and five, I would say, per day. We had another question again about um, books, if, if there's an option to buy used books, or does the teacher... Um, Oh, it does the teacher put you in groups or do it yourself? Okay, so those are two separate questions. Um, if uh, the first one being about the books and the second one being about the groups. So you are not required to get any physical books. Um, so the books that we have as course literature are uh, online sources. So you have access uh, to those through the university library. Um, so you don't need to get any used books or anything like that, um, unless you want to. There's, of course, always opportunity to dive deeper into um, other resources. Um, and for the groups, so in the beginning of uh, the, the first semester, we were um, divided into co-tutor groups. So it's groups of, at least for us, depending on, I guess, how big... Uh, how many students are involved in the program but for us we have four groups with about 10 students students in each group and this is our uh, co-tutor groups um, and these groups has been uh, a continuation through all the courses so far so we um, obviously like uh, meet and discuss the content of every week, like the lectures, the readings, everything. And these uh, co-tutor groups, um, the, the meetings that we have, they are mandatory. So it's a very important part of uh, the learning experience to be engaged in these group activities. Um, and also naturally, so the, the, the people in your co-tutor group will be the ones that you get to know the most um, and it's easy. It's a, it's a very nice way to not only engage with the learnings um, uh, of the of the courses, but also to, you know, have some kind of like personal exchange and and see how like the reflect upon the studies at large beyond what you're learning. Um, talk about uh, everything around it and how it fits into your life and how you reflect on it as uh, you reflect on the 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 learning activities and everything as you go through your life because it's unique for every single person um so it's a very nice opportunity to to connect and reflect and and humble yourself too um and uh if i'm 
I'm not sure if for the second year, if we're going to have the same, probably not the same co-tutor groups, it's probably going to be changed up depending on who decides to do the second year and who uh, is not going to continue with the second year. Very good. Uh, we have two very quick um, more administration questions. Aaron asked uh, when the results of the admitted students will be out. So the results were released on the 7th of this month. So you should be able to check your inbox or the university admissions website and your results should definitely be in there. Um, because yeah, everything got released on the 7th. So whether you were admitted or not, you should have gotten an email regardless. Uh, and if you haven't, make sure to check in with the university admissions. Then the second question, a more administrative question, is how do you log into LISAM? So I believe that you can only log into that once it's closer to the start of class. But do you remember how it was when you first started, Lisa? I think I received my uh, login uh, information a couple of weeks before the program started um, to have access to the the student email and the library and all the different uh, learning tools. Um, so that was very that was pretty close to the beginning of, of the program. Uh, so I don't think you will have access to that in this moment. Uh, but you will be provided information um, once you decided to that you want to study. Uh, you will get all the information. Very good. There's a question about whether you can attend graduation in person uh, or if it's online. Uh, I'm not sure if you have any information about that. Um, I'm, I, I know that there will be a graduation ceremony uh, there for both the first and the second year. So the ones that choose to um, take out their degree the first year, there will be um, a ceremony. I'm not sure though, if it's gonna be a virtual one for, for at least for, for us this year, or if it's uh, taking place on campus. Um, but yes. I think like how it works that like the ceremony is not like mandatory in order to receive your degree. It's more of a, um, you know, technicality. I think at least how I understand it, that you need to apply for your degree after you conducted your studies. Um, maybe yeah. you know more, more than me, Rebecca. Yeah, actually, I was just looking for it. And I think I have a, a good answer for that. So the way Lin Shipping University does the graduation ceremonies for all international programs, both online and in person, is that at the end of each year, there's um, of each semester, I believe there's a graduation ceremony. Um, and as long as you've completed your studies, you can attend uh, any ceremony after that. But only one of them. So if you go to one of them, then you can't go to a second one, but you don't have to uh, go to it uh, the day, the year that you finish. So you could go the year after, for example. Um, and I just checked their form. They do have the option uh, to, to join in on that physical graduation ceremony if you are from a distance program. So the way it was for me, I'm, I'm going to finish my studies this semester is that I got a form. Uh, and then I can enroll and I think you get two plus ones, at least that's um, so a plus two. Um, so that's how it's working this semester specifically. And I was just looking for the form and I saw it. So there's definitely an option to say that you're, for example, from the gender studies program or from the aging program. So if you'd like to, to have a graduation ceremony in person, that is definitely an option. But I do believe since this is a distance program, I'm sure that there will be some sort of um, compensation for that. So hopefully that answers that question. We have another question about how, what are you going to do about uh, accommodation during the face-to-face -face week? Is that something that you have to cover yourself? Is that something that a university provides? Um, so it's up to every student to uh, figure out the accommodation. Um, the university will not provide any um, housing or um, other solution to that. So it, it's up to each and every one. I know that some people are um, are finding Airbnbs together with other students who's traveling from out of town or from from abroad. Um, and uh, I, I'm 
um, I think there's, you know, both Airbnb opportunities or hotels and, and um, other options. Um, but I haven't, I haven't been to Lin Shopping uh, myself yet. Hopefully in, in September I will go. So I haven't been in this situation. Um, I know, however, that some classmates are looking into Airbnbs at the moment. Very good. Um, we have another question um, from someone that's going to study the Aging and Social Change program. And they're a first generation student. So they're asking what the best way to address program specific questions and concerns is. So in this situation, you definitely want to email your course coordinator or the program coordinator. You can find that information on your program website. So if you go to Linship University programs and you search for the name of your program on that page, you will find the information of the program coordinator. And if you have any program specific questions or concerns, definitely reach out to them and they'll be able to answer your questions. So hopefully that answers that question. We have another question about what the roll call looks like for the online programs. Um, the roll call. So um, there was, uh, let me see if I remember this correctly. So we, the first roll call, there was, uh, it was virtually and uh, it was mandatory to be there. And um, um, they just, you just needed to show up and show that you're in attendance, um, but it was virtual. So it was uh, through Zoom, right? Um, and uh, that's how I remember it. I don't know if I have any more information on that. Do you know anything more, Rebecca? Uh, I'm afraid not, but uh, the roll call, at least for the in-person programs, and I, I doubt that it's very different for the online programs, it's basically you have to be present to confirm that you are interested in, in participating and are going to participate in this program. So you might get some valuable information from your course coordinator, you might get some tips and things like that. But the main idea is that you're just confirming your interest that you want to take part in this program and that you're going to take part in this program. So you might get some information about how LISAM works and what kind of resources you have available to you. Um, but it's not going to be a very big event. So it's really just about uh, kind of welcoming you because it's closer to the start of class. So that's, that's the information that I can um, help with. We have someone asking whether it's preferable to have a two-year program versus a one-year program, or maybe you could um, tell us what, kind of what your train of thought was for deciding to have a two-year program. Um, it's a good question. I've been back and forth on it. Um, my intention at first was to do one year. Uh, I changed my mind because I find it very uh, appealing to do the second year as well. Um, and the structure of the program is that the first year uh, you tap into a lot of uh, the fundamental theories, like you lay the, the ground, the, fun, the, the fundament for uh, the second year, which is uh, more in depth um, and uh, go beyond the, you know, the, the basic theories and, and concepts and, and so forth. Um, so, and I, I do think it depends a little bit on what where you see yourself um, after your studies and maybe even um, where you're located, where you want to uh, engage professionally. Uh, so in Sweden, for example, we do distinguish between uh, one and two year masters. Um, so your future employees will uh, have different requirements for, for different uh, positions, whether so, so they are valued differently in Sweden. However, I'm based in the US and it's not looked, um, it's not understood um, in the same way or it's not um, taken in account for in the same way as in Sweden. So if you do a one or two year master's, it might not have um, that big of a difference in, in, in the US setting. Um, so I think it depends on, uh, what your intention is with the program, uh, where you hope to do, what you hope to do afterwards and where potentially. Um, and um, for me, I felt like, you know, after one year, uh, I do feel like, you know, I have a little bit of a hunger to learn more 
and I do feel there's there's more for me to uh, to learn and to engage with and and go deeper and beyond. Um, so I'm very happy now that I've made a decision to to continue. We've had someone ask how many pages your first master's thesis is, um, um, and also if you were allowed to choose your own research question. Yes, yeah, so it's uh, it's all up to you to choose your research question, um, and. Uh, um yeah you can it's it's a very creative opportunity for you to dive into do research about something that you're passionate about or something that interests you um and the first one is a little bit um simpler than the second one um and you're not expected to uh, be as elaborate on your methods and theories um for example um and it's a uh, 15 um, points course uh, and it's the, so it's the same um, amount of time that you spend on, on both the different pieces it's just the you exp you're expected less of in the first one um, and I think the first one uh, I'm just I'm not entirely sure yet but I think it's usually between like 40 and 45 pages um, that you're expect expected to write and for the second one, I think uh, you're expected to write uh, a little bit more. Great. We, we have some more um, a bit technical questions. Uh, we have someone asking if we know whether this year will be virtual or not. So this is uh, unfortunately a little bit hard for us to say at the moment, but Lisa did say that for the next semester, she, she will be on campus. And of course, this is going to depend on the COVID situation at the moment. So if we have another wave of cases and, and it becomes really, really difficult for you to travel to Sweden, of course, the program or the, the course, um, the program coordinator, I mean, is going to take that into account. So, of course, this is a distance program. And if it's extremely difficult to travel to Sweden, that will be taken into account. But as it looks right now, it, things seem pretty well at the moment. So um, as it looks right now, there uh, the the in-person face-to-face uh, weeks are, are going to go ahead. But of course, this can change depending on the pandemic situation and other situations. Um, we have a question about whether you are allowed to take extra subjects from other degrees out of interest. Uh, so subjects that are not required by the master's program you're enrolled in. So of course this depends on where you are. Uh, I don't know if you've ever taken a, an extra course, Lisa. Uh, I have not. Um, also because I'm not physically in Lin shopping, so I I can't take any on campus courses. Um, and also how the Swedish university system works is that you're usually uh, engaged in a program, and those courses within that program are um, created for the, the program students only. So you're not, you don't have a free access to, to choose any course that you want or that you're interested in. However, there are some courses that's, um, but mostly on entry level um, that you can choose uh, to engage with, but that's separate from your program and you cannot incorporate that into your degree. Um, and I don't, I don't know te the technicalities of that. Um, I know that we will be offered um, to join um, uh, another course next year that's not in the program if we choose to, that's gonna be online. And it's a, some kind of a specific arrangement that I don't, I don't know that much about yet. Um, but uh, yeah, depending on where you are and uh, and what you're interested in, um, there could there could be opportunities, but but um, I think they're fairly limited uh, mm. doing yeah. distance studies. Yeah, of course the the distance is going to be a, a limiting factor, but I do know that uh, there are some students on from on campus programs that decide to do an extra subject. But that is always, especially if that subject is from a different program, that's always kind of limited um, by the approval of the coordinator of that course specifically. So it could be that there's no extra spots in that specific course, so then you, you will be rejected. And of course, the prerequisites are very important. So if you don't meet the prerequisites of that course, then you will also not be accepted there. 
but it is possible to apply to uh, individual courses. Um, but of course, it's always a little bit of a gamble. I would recommend for this to speak to your course coordinator um, and or a program coordinator, I mean, and ask them for advice. Um, we also have uh, study advisors, and I'm sure that there are um, some available for distance programs as well. And you can definitely mention that you'd be interested in maybe taking this course or that course, um, and they can give you a lot more advice than I can. Um, and they can also advise you in the sense of whether this is possible regarding your distance program or your current schedule and so on and so forth. All right. We, we had another question regarding group work. Maybe you could repeat that part about how much group there, there is and how you make it work from a distance program. Um, so all the group work uh, that's taking place within the program so far has been in co-tutor groups. And these are groups that you're assigned in the beginning of the program. And it's approximately 10 students in each group. Uh, and then um, for every course, usually you have a co-tutor meeting uh, once a week that's uh, mandatory, but it's up to the individuals in the group to schedule this meeting. So if, you know, we're, we're all in different time zones, different, you know, we have different schedules and so forth. So um, we try to find a time that works for all of us. And then of course, uh, there's always uh, situations where maybe one or two are not able to attend. And usually there's, you know, um, an acceptance of like missing one or two um, at each, each, each course, uh, or if you're missing more than that, you can do a, um, an extra little assignment to catch up to um, um, what you potentially missed out on. Um, and uh, also like some group, uh, there are some group assignments or um, papers that you write in groups and in some of the courses. And then usually we always fall back on the co-tutor groups because they're already there. So um, for example, we, in one course, there was a, uh, a group assignment to write an, uh, a paper uh, in small groups. And then we used to split our co-tutor group into smaller groups. So we work within that. And because they're very accessible and you already know the students within your own co-tutor group pretty well. Uh, and you can work out uh, a flexible um, working schedule and, and so forth. Um, so if you have a tight schedule, or if you're in a specific time zone, you can work that out with your classmates. Are these groups assigned at random? Do you get to make the group yourself? Is it the teacher that does the groups? Um, so in the beginning of the program, they, the program coordinator or the course coordinator uh, made the co-tutor groups. And then I think we were asked um, if it was the second course or third course of the first semester, if we wanted to uh, change it up uh, and also if how we wanted to do that. But we choose to just stick with the groups that we had because it's convenient and, and easy and we already know each other. Um, so yeah, they were assigned by the, uh, the course coordinator in the beginning of the program okay. at random, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question here about whether there are courses or seminars about English academic writing offered by Leo that can help non-native speakers perform better. Um, I know that there's some in-person ones. I don't know if you have any information about online options. Um, I do think that the university provides, um, you, you can book sessions with student, like advisors or mm -hmm. academic. Um, I haven't done that myself. Uh, yeah, however, yeah. within the, this program, um, gender studies, there's uh, um, the, the academic writing process is seen to be a little different within uh, gender studies. So there's a lot of emphasis on that. So we do have uh, courses and lectures on how to improve your academic writing uh, within the field of gender studies within the program that's offered to you. Um, and I also think that we have access to different resources and articles and books and how to improve. 
Um, so that's, uh, that's at least my experience. I don't know if there's other resources that the university offers. It might be. Yeah, I know the, the library definitely offers some courses and I do think they have been online recently. Um, but you can definitely reach out to someone to, um, to give you some help with academic writing specifically. About English skills, I do not think that there is anything spe so specifically about English. Uh, it's more focused on academic writing because all the programs do require you to have a certain level of English. So they do expect you to, to have that. Um, but for academic writing, there's definitely resources. And if I think it's on the library page. So if you have a look at that, you should be able to find some resources as well. And now we're running out of time. So I'm just going to try to quickly go over the remaining questions. Um, someone's asked of whether there are junior research jobs offered by the university in the field of gender studies. Um, I'm going to ask you to go to the vacancies page. So if you go to liu.sc slash vacancies, then you get to the Lin Xiaobing University vacancies page and you can keep an eye on it. Um, the positions are rotating all the time. I know that sometimes there are offers regarding gender studies, sometimes they're not. So you can keep an eye on that, but you can also keep an eye on the vacancies pages from various Swedish universities. So you, if you keep an eye on that, you should definitely be able to get an answer for that. There's a question about whether there are any Erasmus or international exchange opportunities. I'm not entirely sure about this. I don't know if you um, have any experience with possible exchanges, Lisa. Um, I mean, since it's an online program, I, I don't. We don't do at, at least not within this program. There's not um, like official opportunities to do uh, exchange programs because yeah. um, it's not based on campus. Um, but there's opportunities uh, for the second year at least to do. Um, internships for example hmm. if you want a certain kind of uh, experience elsewhere you can seek uh, internship in internship positions elsewhere um, but in terms of exchange um, that's not something that's um, officially offered yeah yeah i would say email your program coordinator they will definitely have the answer to this uh, and if you're interested in doing uh, an internship and such they will definitely be able to answer your questions about that um, we had a question as well about uh, the timing of the mandatory meetings, whether they're more like in the mornings or in the afternoons, but I guess it, it also depends because in, in the study groups you're kind of making your own schedule, is that correct? That's, yeah, so within the co-tutor groups it's up to you completely. Hmm. Uh, however, like the, the seminars and some real time sessions uh, will depend on the the teacher's schedule hmm. um, but and that's in in a Swedish time zone right so a lot of them are in the morning some are in the afternoon it all depends on the teacher's schedule okay um, and some of them I haven't been able to participate in because it's been in the middle of the night for me okay. um so I needed to do an assessment whether it was going to be do I want to wake up at three o'clock in the morning yeah. and, and participate or can I get that information elsewhere? Unless it's a mandatory session, then of course uh, it requires me to go the extra mile and wake up extra early. Um, yeah, um, I think that's kind of the consequence of doing a distance program for anywhere in the world. One final question that we have time for is what do we need to bring during the face-to-face -face weeks? Um, so maybe a laptop, you know, but what else would you think you, you'll need to bring during the face-to-face -face weeks? Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I haven't had a face-to-face -face week on campus yet, but from the face-to-face -face weeks that we, uh, that we've done in a virtual space, um, you know, a computer to access, uh, the readings and, uh, other resources and be able to write assignments, papers. Uh, so basically your computer um, and if you're coming out of town or from from uh, from elsewhere, you obviously need to bring um, maybe warm clothes <laughs> if it's cold <laughs> yes. or if it's yes. raining. That's a good um, tip. 
Yeah, I think I'll I'll end it there and I'll also link everyone to our resources. So we have an international student blog. So if you Google international student blogs Liu, you can find a lot of blog posts that were made by uh, students. So just like you, most of them are doing in-person programs. Um, but we also had one student that was doing a distance program this year. So you can check out the student blogs. There's lots of information about Linshipping and student life at Liu. So if you have any questions about what the face-to-face -face weeks might look like, you can definitely look for information there. We also have a podcast called Fika with us. Um, and there is an episode on there with who's also that's also an interview with someone that's studied gender studies. And it, it's a bit more personal about what they studied before and what they're doing now and uh, what their thesis was like. So you can check out that podcast as well. And of course, we have um, an Instagram account that's uh, linshipping.university, which is also student run. So you can ask lots of questions about student life. And you should definitely follow that Instagram account because we will be doing some matchmaking uh, closer to the summer. So then you will be able to meet people that are from your program um, and hopefully make some friends in advance. Uh, and, and hopefully that makes it a little bit less daunting to study a distance program. But other than that, that's it for today. Uh, thank you so much for participating. Thank you, Lisa, for being here. Um, again, congratulations to all of you for getting admitted. Um, yeah, I hope this helped you answer your, some of your questions and calm some of your nerves. And again, you're always welcome to email the international office or your program coordinator if you have any questions. But that's it from us. I don't know if you have anything more to say, Lisa. Always oh, thank you for having me here and uh, good luck with uh, joining the program. And I hope you will enjoy it just as much as I have. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, guys. Hopefully we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.